Okay, should we go to the statesman? Okay, at 269, at 269, we get the story of the origin of the universe. That was confusing. Yeah, it was. I know it's, it's it's confusing, but what I when I when I read Plato and I read the myths, I basically realize that when when you compare like Genesis with this, <laughs> Genesis is much better, you know. Well, but the thing is, Socrates knows he's telling a myth, and he knows that the point of it is not to is not to seize on the myth. The point of it is to understand the point. What's the point? So what I do when I, with all these myths is that I try not to get too much into the details, at least on the first read. But what I try to do instead is I try to just say, well, what's the point? And I think the point he's saying is, is the result of this myth is that God fashioned the universe. Right? God creates the universe. And at some point... He lets the universe go. And what this tells us about the divine is, it, is the divine is what is immutable, as, it, as we're told in the Athanasian Creed. Right? The divine is immutable, cannot change. The heavens and the earth and everything that is created, it can change. They cannot be free from change, meaning they're always in motion. Question. Does is this when I read this, I thought of like the like the Voltaire idea of God of like the clock winder and then leaves it? Or is Plato thinking that he just like is that is that the imagery that he's no I think he I don't think so engaging creation yes. even he's not but so this is almost like giving free will to men? Yes. It's free will but there's still a there's still a a harmony. I mean God leaves there's still a part, there's still, the whole and the parts are still united together. And Voltaire's idea, I think the whole is separate from the part. So in this, and the part runs of its own. I think in this, the whole and the part are united. The part is autonomous, and the part has to figure out how to harmonize itself with the whole. So God's not intervent, intervent, inter, intervening what, as it's starting from the wrong way, then? Is that the whole point? Well... I think the, the turning the wrong way and stuff like that, eventually even that changes. Right? Eventually there's a, there's a kind of creation where he stops turning things both ways. So, But the point, I think, of the myth is that there's a harmony. All motion in the universe is directed to a harmony. And actually that in the end... This, this idea of the revolving universe has to change. It can't be like that. So there, there's not, some people, there's not a circularity to things. There's more of a, of a linear motion to time and motion. Ultimately, the universe is guided by a cause that is extrinsic to the universe. Extrinsic means outside of, I mean, not part of the universe. And it's the creator that gives the universe, whatever immortality the universe has, it's the creator that gives it to the universe. When he, when he moves the universe, he lets it move through countless ages. There's a, there's a final revolution. He stops the revolutions at some point. And at the point he stops the revolutions, men return to their childlike state. They're as if they were newborn babes. Right? Our ancestors preserve a memory of coming out of the earth, <coughs> meaning they were close to the last revolution of things. They are the heralds of the stories that many now unfortunately don't believe that we came from the earth. But the ones who came from the earth are almost blessed. Before the last revolution, animals 
had guardians that cared for them. There were no wild creatures. Animals didn't eat each other. There was no war, no strife. God was the shepherd of man, and he tend and man tended the animals. Man realized he was above the animals, and he, he related to them properly because he realized that he had kind of a divine nature. All were made out of the earth. There was no recollection. We learn in the Philebus that recollection is the soul basically having memories without reference to sensory experiences. Man lived off fruit and agriculture. No clothing, no bedding. There was a good climate. If people in those times used philosophy, it was to grow in wisdom. At some point, there was a big earthquake. Many creatures were destroyed. After the earthquake, there was a calm. During that calm, creatures followed the Creator and Father to the extent that they were able. Right? But then a disorder infected the primeval nature. And this disorder infected the primeval nature before the current order of things was established. The Creator is good, and He created all things good, but when this disorder entered into the nature of things, animals and humans became harsh and unjust. The world, or the universe, separated itself from its pilot. God is the pilot that governs the universe, right? And at this point, the world or universe chooses to separate itself from its pilot, from its guide. When the universe does this, there is more evil than good in the universe. Because the universe now, the universe participates in the goodness of the divine. But inasmuch as it separates itself from the divine, it, it lacks, it, it starts to lose, it starts to lose the level of its being that helps it see how it is divine. In the first moments, when it leaves the divine, it gets along okay. But then, the, hu the universe becomes forgetful, and disorder starts to enter into it. It's the, the Greek word for truth is to not forget. Right, the Greek word for so, what? Yeah, lethe, alethea, lethe is the river of forgetfulness. So ah is not, right? So truth. So so as man leaves the divine, he starts to forget. It's interesting that when the devil, when the devil promises Adam and Eve the fruit, he says you'll become knowledgeable of good and evil. But they actually forget what good is. Right? Because they for, be, when Adam and Eve are in the garden, it's obedience to God that enables them to, to have to kind of keep the divine nature and keep the divine knowledge of things. When they when they when the devil tempts them he says you'll know more. But in the end they know less. Because their experience of evil makes them forget what they knew before, which is that God loved them. And that's why evil, or the, the original sin, is the, is the prototype of all sin. Because all sin promises you that you will experience, by experience you will know more, but by experience you become a slave and you know less when you sin. No? No? Like the Spaniards say, no? 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 Or the French, c'est pas vrai? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have the utmost respect for the French and Spaniards. <clears throat> right, but in, so in the first instance, and this, this, this is the order, this is what God does with people, with families, with nations. When they reject charity in His mercy, in His mercy, He somehow lets them 
it's called the effects of charity. Right? So if, if a place or a family has ever rejected God, you can sometimes see how they, they still do many good things. And the reason why they still do good things is that God is always faithful to his promises. He always gives his gifts. So they might they might be experiencing the effects of charity. Even though they don't have, the effects of charity are different than charity itself. Right? The effects of charity are all the appearances of charity. But it's not actual charity. This happens in the Anglican Church, where oftentimes they have the liturgy, even though it's in English, they have a liturgy that's very beautiful. And they keep all the, all the symbols and signs of the liturgy as it existed in the 15th century. But they don't have the fullness of truth, but they still have some effects of it. I know a saint who one time wondered, he, he asked our Lord in, in prayer, he said, why is it oftentimes that people... Why is it oftentimes that people who reject God seem to live such good lives? Well, it's because God is merciful. The, the, the answer that came to him at one point is that God is merciful and he wants to give them good things. And he might not be able to give them good things when they're dead. So he has to give them good things now. That's a sobering thought. Right? Well, that's the answer that came to the saint. I, you know, so for what it's worth. Saint Jose Maria Escriva. Because <laughs> he's my spiritual father. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It could be dangerous. Yeah, everything is dangerous. Almost almost everything, almost every human experience, I think because of the devil, almost every human experience is fraught with danger. I mean, we talk about how great philosophy is, but philosophers are the worst as far as leading souls away from Christ. <laughs> and philosophers are the worst, even Catholic philosophers, are the worst as far as having intellectual pride. So, everything is, I mean, I, I hate to kind of just be banal, you know, kind of say, oh, well, you know, everything. But everything, every discipline, every way of life has its dangers. I mean, you would say, you know, poor people, you would say poor people, you know, should, should poor people better than wealthy people should have the virtue of detachment. But sometimes you can find a poor person who is more attached to a spoon or I don't know some insignificant little item than wealthy people are to their things that they have so it can be everything can be you know every the, the devil can basically enslave anybody if you're not careful and I'm not saying that to be pessimistic I'm just you know I think I think it's just you know we pray on the week to the four anyway they're more susceptible as well I mean the, the extremes yeah yeah <clears throat> did I answer your question or did I avoid it yeah 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 okay Lord I believe in you help my unbelief hmm? yeah I love that gospel today's gospel is great it's one of my favorite <clears throat> so he says something interesting though in the first entrance everything goes along okay but then man becomes forgetful and disorder prevailed disorder got so big that man was in danger of destruction at that point God steps in so he's not kind of deistic right at that point God steps in to reverse the disorder, to make sound what is unsound, to settle what is unsettled. And he seeks for a way to make man immortal and ageless. That's pretty good. 
when when God does this, all sorts of things start to change. <clears throat> Pregnancy becomes possible, birth and nurture. All the parts of the universe at that point become ordered to God. At the same time that the parts are ordered to God, they can also guide themselves. Animals grow fierce. Men grow feeble and unprotected, ravaged by beasts, without resources, lacking in nunchuck skills. <laughs> And necessity, they do. They lack all skills, he says, which would include nunchuck, nunchuck skills, <laughs> right? Bow hunting skills. And bow hunting skills. And wolverine hunting skills. And wolverine skunning hills. <laughs> right? Necessity forces them to get food. He also, but God gives us a few gifts. Far, far. You know the joke about the guy going through the village in West Virginia, and he sees this. He sees all these. Uh, did I tell you this joke? You know this joke. He sees all these. Uh, he sees all these these uh, these crash scenes with the three kings. But there's a fireman in the first scene. He's like, "What's that fireman doing?" So he, he goes. It goes a couple blocks down. He sees another crash scene with a fireman in it. He goes another, finally he gets, he sees like five or six of these things. And they all have firemen in it. He gets to the end of town and he says, you know, but before I leave this town, I got to ask, you know, what's these, what are these firemen doing in these crash scenes? So he just goes up to this guy that has the last crash scene in town. He knocks on his door and he says, can you tell me why there, why is a fireman in every crash scene in this town? I mean, is it, has the fireman done something special here or something? He says, well, no, didn't you read the scripture? It done not say that the three wise men done come from afar. You would. It doesn't say that the three wise men done come from afar. It's true. He, he said, I think not, but he went to order beer. And, and poof, he disappeared. <laughs> so humans at this point, humans are supposed to be directed, at this point, humans are supposed to be directed to God, but they're also self-moving. They can live their own lives and care for themselves. So how God rules the universe is a pattern or a type of how the shepherd should rule the city, of how the man should rule the city. The man should be a shepherd for the, for the city as God is a shepherd for the universe. So now in the rest of the dialogue, they're going to set out to show how the statesman should rule in a city, what the statesman is, how he cares for his flock, and why he should care for humans as a shepherd cares for his flock. The form of the divine shepherd is the pattern for the king. The king is like the executive. So George Bush is the king of the U.S. The king is not hereditary. King is a position. It, it's, a, it's, an unden it's a sociological fact that every society has a kind of king to it. And this Hobbes is right. Right? Hobbes, no, I mean, he's right not in the sense of how he describes the king, but he's right in understanding that ultimately in every society there is a kind of executive. Right? There is an aspect of political power which is a, which is a commanding power, which deals with foreign affairs, which deals with war and peace, and this power has the responsibility of weaving all the parts of the city together so that the whole can flourish. It has the ultimate say in what the common good is. So when he speaks of kingly power, he's not speaking of hereditary monarchy necessarily, but he's speaking of, a, of I think, almost a sociological fact. You'll also notice that a lot of people say that, oh, you know, Plato had the six regimes, and Socrates never thought of the six regimes. Well, that's because they only read the Republic. 
which is not about political regimes, but it's about the states of the soul. But you see in the statesman that Plato did understand the six regimes. And I think he suggests in the statesman that the seventh regime is the best regime. The six regimes are ideal types. They're all utopias. The best regime is the seventh regime. The seventh regime is the one that weaves together the previous six regimes into a whole. Which is what America tried to do in its founding. No? So, yet again, well, I mean, once again, people basically, they never read the state. I mean, there these the people that say this, they must have never read the statesman. Or if they read it, they read it in some course where they just, like at Harvard, where they just had to talk about it and not read it. <laughs> because he says clearly in the statesman that he talks about the six regimes. At least, at least when I read it, he's, maybe I was on drugs. But I think that's what he said. Maybe. Well, that's your problem, Maybe I should have been on drugs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm offended. Yeah, that right? means just that's, paying the tab. That's, the, that's the worst thing. That's the worst thing that can happen in modern society, right? I'm offended. Actually, the worst thing no, it's fine. You automatically win the argument. That's right. As soon as you say I'm offended, you win the argument. That's right. Yeah. So I win. So I win. I'm offended. <laughs> and you're a dull speaker. <laughs> so fine. Well, I'll put it on the internet. You can listen to it. Yeah. Listen to it from the point where I say I put it on the internet. You got to make some weird, obnoxious noise. It's at one, one, an hour and four minutes. An hour and four minutes? An hour and four minutes. Okay. So start, if you start at an hour and four minutes... Right. You won't and miss you, a beat. You're taking people home, so they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I have a card. Isn't there a song before. called "Take Me Home" by Phil Collins? Yes, there is. It also "Take Me Home, Country Roads." Take me home, Country Roads. Yeah. You should do Irish Idol. <laughs> the ultimate art of the statesman, just so we all know it, the all of the art of the statesman is to care for the common good. And it's actually reading this. I think this is an awesome dialogue. I real. It's one of these dialogues that it's not. It's not flashy. I think in the end, it's not a di. For me personally, anyway, when I first read it, my reaction to it is that it's not a dialogue that's flashy. It's not like the symposium. You, you don't get really excited about it, or the apology. But I never lost interest in it when I was reading it the first time. And at the end, I realized this is an awesome dialogue. That's, that was kind of my first experience of the statesman. Because this dialogue is the first time in my life I felt that I understood what the common good was. Or I could explain what the common good was. Because I think after reading this dialogue, you realize that the weaver is the man or the woman who can take all the you know wool making and wool making and sheep cutting you know cutting the cutting the fleece off of sheep and the loom and wafting and woofing and whatever it is I mean I don't even know all the stuff but the weaver takes all that together and he makes clothing and a very good weaver makes clothing that fits so well a, a friend of mine told me a friend of mine told me that there's still some weavers in New York City who will make personal suits for people. A weaver that knows very well the standards of measurement and everything like that, he can make a suit for you that it almost feels like you can almost move in it and you don't feel the clothing as you move in it. Does that mean there won't be like any seams? It'll just be like... There's seams in everything, okay. but it like fits so... Perfectly. Like everything everything that I wear, everything that's, that's manufactured in factories, just for like it's just one size fits all. Right? It doesn't take into account the various features of the human body that can vary from one person to the next. Well, a real, a real tailor, he can make a suit that, that, that basically allows you to move. Like, when I move like this, I can feel this pulling here and this pulling here, you know. I can feel it. And I mean, not the, it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, right? <laughs> So I have a friend who does, right? But a real a real weaver can make a suit that it, it, it kind of it moves with your body, and that's what the true measure is. 
right? The measure is not a mean between two extremes. The measure is what fits, given who you are, given what the circumstances are. Can we talk about in the uh, gorgeous about the legitimate art and the fake art? Right. Right. So what would you call a common good? So the common good is that w- the common good is that which enables. I, I think as the fruit of this dialogue, the statesman is like the weaver, but he's the weaver of the city. He takes all the institutions of the city, the individuals of the city, and the principles of truth and goodness. And he weaves them all all together so that the city, the individuals, and the groups all flourish. He knows how to... And and flourishing means understanding the truth and living what is good and doing what is good. So the common good is that which enables the individuals, the institution, and the city as a whole to flourish. The statesman is like the doctor of the city, right? There's the, there's the great passage where he says, what would happen if people started going to the doctor and the doctor said, what I'm going to do is cut you up and yank your intestines out and basically make you sick. There's no way people would keep going to that doctor. And yet in cities, that's what we do, right? We follow sophists who basically make the city sick. They're not good doctors because they don't have the principles straight of what it means to be a healthy city and they don't have the practical knowledge to make the city healthy. We we either make the wealthy rule the city because they have money. He says, imagine imagine what would happen to medicine if just just because someone had a lot of money, they could become a doctor with no training. Right? What would become of medicine? Or imagine if in medicine, we just said, the person who wins the election is going to become the doctor. <laughs> that would be democratic de- democratic medicine. You just draw jobs out of a hat, you know, don't even go to your skills at all. Well, that actually, that's what Athens did in its democracy. The, the ruling positions became r- rule by lot. Because if anybody, if anybody can rule... Elections are so easily manipulable by sophists and, and wealthy people. The way to eliminate that is just to have a lottery. So who's going to rule this year? We'll just have a lottery, and that'll decide it. If, if one person's rule is as good as another, that's the only fair way to do it. Can I give you the short story of the lottery? Yeah. Yeah. Where, with the black spot and the one person gets stoned to death to yeah. for everyone's sins? Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. Software, yeah, I, I forget who wrote that. Same yeah. Category is the lady and the tiger. So then he starts going into the kinds of government, right? Man can govern with compulsion or voluntarily. And he 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 he, he distinguishes between the king and the tyrant here. See, we Democrats, we we never distinguish between the king and the tyrant, right? Any one man rule is tyranny for us. But he says no, right? One man rule, one man rule. If it's one man rule, if it's not by compulsion, but it's free, it's not tyranny. And every kind of rule could be this way, compulsion or, 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 or voluntarily. Ultimately, the statesman is grounded in the truth. Right? If the statesman is not grounded in the truth then it's like a pilot lost at sea. The city is like a pilot who's lost at sea. But the statesman knows how to mix together correct opinions to lead people from ignorance and false opinion so that the city and everybody in it can attain the truth or wisdom, not by compulsion, but freely. The weaver knows how to do this with clothes. The king knows how to do it with statecraft. Now, it's very fascinating, the middle part of this dialogue. The middle part, I think, runs from 283 to 287. At least numerically, that's the middle. And this is where he describes what the weaver does. In 283, he basically describes how the logos is the standard 
that enables the weaver to weave things together to make the garment. Excess and deficiency would be a garment that's either too big or too small. There's an art of measure in words or deeds that can be excess or deficiency with respect to the mean. Right? The weaver can determine the greater or the smaller. The weaver knows how to produce with respect to the greater and the smaller. If there's no mean, it's interesting, if there's no mean, this goes all the way, this answers questions asked at the beginning of the Protagoras, I mean the Protagoras. Right? If there's no mean, we can't make an argument. If there's no standard by judging our behavior, then if, there, if there's no standard by judging the behavior of the weaver, then the weaver can make any garment. And he can say that it fits. Because he made it. So the weaver can make, you know, pants that go down to your knees, and he can say, oh, that's just, you know, it's modern, modern weaving. Right? And what can you say about it if there's no mean? If there's a mean, this is the thing of modern fashion and modern art oftentimes. It, 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 it's based on the assumption that there is no mean. There's no standard by judging art or fashion, right? That's, that's what it's trying to show. Our modern humor oftentimes is like this, as we see in the vulgar comic strips of The Observer, right? There's no mean, so you can say anything. You can do anything. Well, Socrates says if this is the case... The elder, the uh, the Athenian stranger, right? If this is the case, if there's no mean, then there's really no such thing as garment making, right? Because there's no way to judge whether something is good or bad. It's just better or worse based on. And the person who controls garment making is the is is the person who he. It's what he says it is. It's not. There's no mean to judge his what he does. If there is a mean then we can say that the, the weaver can make clothing that is good and beautiful. It's good and beautiful. It's good because it keeps you warm and beautiful maybe also because it makes you look more attractive. If we do away with the mean, there's no, poss there's no real possibility for statesmanship. There's no possibility of the kingly, kingly art. If we do away with the mean, then that means that non-being exists. Because there's no being by which to judge things. Because the, the greater and the lesser are not just in relation to each other ultimately. They're in relation to being. Being is the mean. It's the standard for judging truth and falsity. It's the standard for ultimately judging good and evil. Without the mean, there's no being, there's no existence... And then there, therefore there's no statesman because there's no man of knowledge who can lead us in practical affairs to what is good or true. If there's no being, then we're all tyrants. We're all tyrants in the making who are trying to control images so that we can gain power. The mean enables us to demonstrate absolute and precise truth and to see how the arts are measured in relation not only to each other, but to the standard. If there is the mean, the arts exist. If not, then there's no such thing as art. I mean, without the mean, art disintegrates into nothingness, as Picasso shows us. The mean enables us to understand the moderate. We can understand things as they relate to their essential nature and how they differ from their essential nature. So all sorts of questions are answered also in the statesman, right, that are asked early on in the dialogues. Yet another reason just to read all the dialogues and not just one of them. There's so many philosophy professors who just read like the Meno or they read the Lockies or even the Apology sometimes or the Republic or the Gordon, you know, then they basically say, well, in the end, Socrates doesn't answer any questions. He just asks questions at the end of his dialogues. Well, did you ever notice, I don't know if you noticed this, but at the end of the say statesman, there's no questions. 
they seem to have come to a completion in their argument. In some ways, the, sta- the also as reading the statesman, I mean, you know, I maybe shouldn't admit this. I kind of started getting excited about reading the laws. Because the laws is the, the the statesman I think is an outline of the laws, right? And the laws is the true practical philosophy of Plato, not the Republic. The Republic is the analogy of the soul. The laws is the real. The laws I think is the statesman worked out into more detail. So with the mean, now we can understand moderation. How things exist with respect to their essential nature. And the statesman can, who understands the essential nature can understand how the city and the parts of it exist with respect to the essential nature of the city. Some things are appearances. They don't they don't really participate in the essential nature of the thing. They only seem to be. Some things are part of the essential nature of things, but they're not easily seen by human wisdom. And so that they don't easily satisfy the human person. It's like it's like I remember people oftentimes will say, "Well, I don't understand the mass. I don't get anything out of the mass." Why? It's one of those things that it's part of our essential nature to eventually understand it, but it doesn't have an immediate appeal to our passions. It's like what Cardinal O'Connor said. What Cardinal O'Connor said one time when I saw him speak, I think at World Youth Day. He said, you know, well, I'm sure that the Mass was not, a, I'm sure that the first Mass was not attractive to Christ either. Right? I mean, the cross is not an attractive proposition from the standpoint of the human passions. But yet, it's something that makes us happy. So with everything that is, with everything that is, we should seek to give and understand the logos of the thing. With everything that is, we should seek to give and understand the logos of the thing. Ultimately, in the case of man, Christ is the logos of man. Man, to become fully man, has to become Christ. It, or as this, to quote the Second Vatican Council, and not only the, the letter and the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, right? Christ, and this is probably written by Carol Wojtyla, right? Christ fully reveals man to himself. Reason and nous, N-O-U-S, is what understands immaterial things. It's the greatest and noblest part of man. And this is the only way the only way we can avoid the problem of the sophist is basically to acknowledge that the logos is the standard of measure and that man has to develop a science for understanding the logos. This is ultimately the standard of fitness and pleasure which is the philobus which is what follows on the statesman is only secondary to this consideration. The ultimate, and even even finishing the argu- argument logically, is secondary to this consideration. The first consideration should be that we use what is highest in us to see the truth, not pleasure, and not logic. In other words. And also not the longness, not the length or the shortness of speeches. He says if John Adams, by the way, hated Plato because he said Plato's speeches are too long and there's too roundabout. He never gets to the point directly enough. 
right? And this is a critique of a lot of moderns about Plato. And uh, the answer, of, well, one thing is to read Aquinas. But even with Aquinas, you could say, look, Aquinas is very slow and plodding in the way he gets to things. He, know, he doesn't just directly attack. Right? <laughs> but what, what Socrates says, what Socrates says here at 287, this kind of person, ha John Adams has to ask himself if being briefer, he could better prepare people to be dialecticians and better prepare them to discover the truth of realities. I think, I, and I don't know how to answer this question, but a lot of times it seems like somehow you have to, how do you, that's the big question, how do you foster in people a real sense of wonder that, me, that leads them to want to discover the truth? A lot of times people that just write treatises, the typical adolescent male will just say, oh, I know that, and discard it without looking into the argument. Pardon? Some barbarians. Yeah. And so I think what Plato is trying to do is he's trying to deal with the adolescent male. He's trying to say, well, how do we how do we get the adolescent male to take these things seriously? You know, and I think that's in part the di what the dialogue is meant to do. So once we understand that, I think the rest of the dialogue makes sense. <laughs> Right? There's all sorts of things in the state which we can't give priority to. We can't give priority. In other words, the statesman has to learn how to weave these things together. The military. Play or entertainment. Manufacturing. Agriculture. The commercial class. He says the commercial class or statesmen will always try to make themselves seem to be the real rulers of states like Bill Gates and people like that. Bill Gates and Stephen Covey, How to Lose Friends and Influence No One. <laughs> That's the book I'm going to write someday. <laughs> how to Lose Friends and Influence No One. I think that's a much better book than how to... It's funny, that, that's Bill Carney. Have you ever heard of uh, The Way Before? It's a pretty big cult out of central Ohio. And I've heard of the way, the book, the way. No, it's, it's, it's like a, they claim to be the true scholars of the Bible with the true text. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. But anyway, they require all of their inductees to read that book and become an expert marksman with the rifle. Huh. Those are the two requirements to, wow. are to, are to master that book and to uh, become an expert marksman. And I'm not sure why the combination. Because if you're influencing well, friends and stuff. Hunt yeah, you have to hunt for the truth. <laughs> At 291, he goes into the, the six forms of government. And actually, if, if you understand his variables here, there's more than six forms of government. But notice, for example, in this, in this example here, he's not a critic of democracy in the end. He's a critic of democratic anarchy. The form of democracy that's bad is democracy mixed in with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right? That's democratic anarchy. Democracy without law. The, the democracy of Pausinius from the symposium, right? The democracy that gets rid of all custom and law, which is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, if you ever go to it. Leave Cleveland alone. No, this is not Cleveland. <laughs> this is the rock. This is my experience of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's pretty accurate. I mean, just go if you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you just listen to the speeches. They're advocating democratic anarchy, sexual democratic anarchy. That's what it is. And so you, to, be, to be for democracy, for healthy democracy, you have to critique the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Otherwise, your society will end up in a society of lust and cruelty, and you'll become a vicious empire, which will seek to engage in pornographic violence against any possible music? country. Folk music is, the, if you want to rebuild a culture, you have to, you have to in other words, the way, the way rock and roll corrupted the United States was that Pete Seeger and his sister, Carol Seeger, who was invited to campus last Friday, right? I went. It's true. But they, they set out they set out in their in their youth. They they came up they were they were goal oriented in their youth. They were goal oriented and they, they had a plan for success. 
right? They, they, were, they, they had a plan for becoming highly successful people, of winning friends and influencing others. And their plan for success, they, they were goal-oriented, right? We all, want, we all want to be goal-oriented. They're goal-oriented. They're goal, they realize that to change the culture, to make democratic anarchy possible, you have to change the music. Because as Aristotle says, if you change the music, you can change the laws. And if you change the laws, you can change the habits and customs of people or the culture. I personally don't think there's any difference between custom and culture. They basically mean the same thing. Culture is just the modern way of saying it to try to... It is. It's just the modern way of saying it to try to avoid talking about custom. It's basically a way of saying custom is evil and we have to obliterate custom and replace it with culture. Right? But it's, because custom is, it enslaves you. Right? It's, it's, because custom is like law, it's, it enslaves you, it makes you get engaged and married. Custom is right? like the, the social contract and culture is the art. It is. No, no, that's true, but that's that's the kind of the democratic sexual anarchist, that's what they are that's what they would say about custom. Yes, we're fine, thank you. But then they, they replace it with culture. Right? They replace it with culture. Culture is attractive. Culture is, culture is mute, you know, custom is authoritarian. Culture is music and liberation from a custom, right? But it's really the same thing. It's just a new set of customs. Now, I know I'm in a minority when I say that, but it, I'm just not convinced. And you will never, con I don't think you'll ever convince me that custom is different from culture. I think that's a, it's a mask of the modern age to get us to do away with all good customs and to replace them with corrupt customs. That's all it is. Once again, it's a form of intellectual contraception, as most modern thought is. Most modern thought, in the end, is a form of intellectual contraception. In other words, it's a, it's a way of it's a way of limiting what your intellect can really do. It's it's a way of it's a way of inhibiting the natural processes of the intellect. Rather than letting them de develop and lead to spiritual lead to intellect, like Socrates says, he's the midwife. He's the midwife of the truth. He'll help you deliver babies, which are ideas that are true. Right. So modern philosophy is intellectual contraception. It prevents you from really thinking. They're disfigured or, or, or you don't even produce ideas because, because you follow your passion so you can't think anymore. So, uh, I forgot what the line of thought was there. But to real quickly sum up things, because I know we all got to go. What does the so what does the statesman weave together? He weaves together all the forms of government. He weaves together the laws. He weaves together the possibility of people that don't go along with the laws because they're doing what is good. He's not a stargazer in the end. Even though the sophist will make him out to be a stargazer. He weaves together all the arts and questioning and the multitude. He weaves together the art of judging and rhetoric. He weaves together all these things, popular opinion, courage, temperance, moderation. He weaves together all these things to create bonds or ties to hearken to the little prince, right? Ties that unite people together so that they can together pursue the divine. And human ties follow on these spiritual ties that he creates. He also concerns himself with the family, marriage, children, and bureaucrats and administrators. He weaves them all together 
I've just gone through the whole second half of the dialogue in a broad sweep. But he weaves them all together to draw them together to the ties of friendship and community so that they all have affection for the common life. They want to perfect, help each other, perfect each other. And they want all these, they want, everybody wants to see all these things flourish so the city can be happy. And in the end, the statesman washes over and rules the city with care. Not to make money, not to become militarily powerful, but he watches over and he rules the city with care. And he also, like the whole discussion of courage, he, he, he makes sure that the pacifists don't get control because the pacifists will let foreign powers come in and take the city over. But he also doesn't allow the warmongers to take control so that they lead the city to become an empire and destroy the city. And so that's what the sophist, that's what the statesman, sorry, does. And that, but that's the difference in the end between the, sa the sophist and the statesman. The sophist tries to augment power to himself, in the end to destroy himself and the city. The statesman basically tries to weave together the city as a whole so that everybody flourishes.